Okay, so when I was invited to speak, it said it should be a provocation. So I said, <laughs> right up my street, perfect. Um, so I apologise in advance, but if you feel in any way sort of affronted or sort of taken back, that's good. It's doing what it should be doing. Um, and my title of mine is that a system based on structural inequalities cannot be reformed. Uh, they must be totally reimagined. And this is a paraphrase from Everyday Racism, who was speaking about similar systems in workplaces and industries across the UK. But I thought it's particularly apt to archaeology, which, as we know, has a very distinct problem with a lot of different inequalities issues. Um, and it's often described as that, as Megan was saying, people leaving the profession, a leaky, leaky pipeline, which is a really nice sort of cosy way of putting it. Little drippy, leaky pipeline. It's not, it's a massive torrent, a barely contained stretch thread of people leaving. Um, so I really want to talk about that today and why it's happening and sort of what we could potentially do to address it. So we all know what selection bias is, what survives in the archaeological record. It's what basically a lot of our careers are based on, interpreting what's left, knowing what's not there. Um, but what about the selection bias of our, us archaeologists ourselves? You know, who remains in the profession decides what the profession does. It decides what we interpret, how we interpret things, what research we design, um, which clients we work with. The whole emphasis on what we look at as archaeologists is decided upon that selection bias of the archaeologists within the profession. Um, and it's one heck of a bias. Uh, we know that university cohorts are actually fairly diverse. There's actually quite a good even spread of gender. There's uh, quite a lot of uh, disabled people with chronic illnesses at university. Um, there is quite a lot of representation from the global majority at university. And then you start early career, and already there's a lot less. You start to get to mid-career, even fewer. And then at the very top levels, it's pretty devastating the figures up to get to that end. So that's the selection bias in our present, uh, within our preference in our profession. Um, so what I want to ask as my main provocation for this is, well, what's been lost because of that? What ideas, what interpretations, how many careers that could have been something have sort of been lost on? What is I call an altar of ego? Because it really is the ego of people already in the profession that's stopping the change happening. It's the refuse to change a culture that is comfortable, that as, as Pete Hinter said this morning, it does work, it is sustainable to a degree at the moment because everyone loves the status quo because it just keeps hopping along. Um, but it's a cult of exceptionalism. It's, oh, as archeologists, we are the experts. We provide the interpretations. We know the narrative, um, but it's, it's a very narrow narrative. You know, there's a this, this status quo. What, what's it actually achieving? It's, it's producing things, it's interpreting things, it's bringing results, but it's for a very narrow demographic that that's actually representing. And it's, it's limiting what we as archaeologists can deliver as public value because we're delivering for a very narrow public because of that. Um, and what is that status quo? Um, as a lot of people already mentioned a lot of these points today, it's not a sustainable future. The wages are stagnating and the working conditions. People are leaving or indeed not entering the profession because you can't sustain a family on it. If you have any kind of care and responsibility, no chance. What lots so much away work, so much inflexible hours. Um, that flex, no, there's no chance of flexible hours in many roles at all. Even if you're not out in doing field work, um, any action on inequality that's been taken has been surface level, really tokenistic. Um, the research that CIF have recently been doing um, with Cultural Associates Oxford and the survey that we did recently showed that all of the people who would have affected by that inequalities work, it's not working. They're still leaving. They're still not being. Um, taken seriously, they're still being harassed and bullied, um, they're still sort of dropping out and out and out of their profession so um, it's it's not worked and we can pat ourselves on the back all we like for having awareness, for having training but it's, if it's not actually working then we need to change um, progression or even entry is barred then for all of those people who are anyway marginalised by the system bullying harassment still rife, um, as you saw on that presentation this morning 93% of people 90% of people have seen harassment or bullying happen in the workplace. Um, and obviously, if it's that, happening that much, then our actions to target it have not been working. Um, and then on the more serious, sort of really hard hitting end, a lot of our work at archaeology is being co-opted by really, really, um, really unpleasant far-right conspiracy theorists, um, dog whistling agitators, anyone who can use a story to turn to their narrative about their particular issue of the moment. Um, and it's not being called out enough by people with a position to do so. Now and then you'll see um, uh, people release a statement or they'll respond on Twitter. But why are not executive or governance level people responding? Um, and in some cases, they're actually perpetuating it by continuing to lose certain language, by continuing to do certain behaviours that 
sort of just emphasise the fact that it's okay to use archaeology that way or it's okay to continue these narratives. So all the people that are then affected by that, they go, well, not a great profession to be in if these issues aren't being tackled, I'm out. So the result, I think the real result is how can you reform a system with so many embedded issues that has been built from the ground up from really sort of, it's, it's grown from colonialism, it's grown from that whole system and those practices conscious or not unconscious, are absolutely fundamental to archaeology. So it requires, unfortunately, a quite a total reform. Um, but you can't have revolution without revolutionary practice. So a lot of this might feel like panic-inducing. It might feel like, how can I achieve this? How can my organisation achieve this? But how can you not afford to achieve this if you want an archaeological profession to happen in 10, 20, 50 years' time, which it won't be when the current level of directors, the current level of governance are gone? Who replaces them? You know, what systems are being in place? You need to flatten those management structures out so that all people across your organization have a voice. They're all invested in what you're doing. They can see that when they're coming up in five, 10 years time, that the ideas they started with are being carried through your organization. Collaborative practice needs to happen so that everyone in the workforce is invested in what you're doing. They all feel like they're part of it and they're not just, they're just doing some grunt work that somebody else is gonna profit off or someone else is gonna showcase at a conference like this. Um, why isn't flexible working the norm? You know, we're in the 21st century. We can dial in to do things. We can have flexible working hours. We can have job shares. Why are they not happening? It's really not rocket science. Equal maternity, paternity leave, really simple thing that can really help to iron out a lot of those structural inequalities about parental care and responsibilities. More equitable pay models. We still know there's lots of different pay gaps based on, you know, all lots of different protected characteristics. But also, there should be a lot more compression between those lower and higher wages. Because nothing says that you don't value the lower staff and you're paying them on absolutely dirt pay, but they can see the directors on a fairly heftier package than them. Um, I don't suggest there shouldn't be any difference in wages, but there should be um, much less of a gulf. Those early career people, what message does it send if they come in and they can't survive on that wage? They're never going to go any further. Um, invest in accessible tools. Someone asked me a question this morning after our presentation about um, disability in archaeology. Um, why have we not got a social model of making things accessible for disabled people, not seeing their disability as a medical hindrance? You can make tools more accessible. You can make methods and techniques more accessible. Your sites can be made more accessible. You could train your staff so they don't have an unconscious bias about working with people with disabilities or health conditions. They're all things that they don't take a radical or in some cases even massively expensive or complicated things to ameliorate them, but it does require a shift in direction, a shift in focus. Um, we need to have more diverse boards and governance and direct levels. I often hear the excuse that, oh, but these people aren't in management now, so how can they be in governance soon? You get them in, in accelerated programs, you get them from other industries. You start programs now, which will start to deliver very quickly, not in 10, 20 years time when it's too late. They need to be in place now, so they're learning this now. Um, we all, and relate to that, it's, it's really radically altering those recruitment practices because at the moment, people aren't even bothering to come into recruitment because they know the systems that are working at the moment are not working well. Um, why are there not things like online panels before you come to job interview so you know what it's going to be like, you can meet people. Um, when you have job packs for a job, who is represented within those job packs, what can they see of the rest of your organisation? Um, it's just lots of th things that add up to... Um, if you're outside of that lived experience, you wouldn't necessarily know that there was an issue. But that's why having people at all these levels means that you will pick up on those things and realise. Um, and my final point on here, and before I get onto some slightly more spicy ones on the next slide, um, <laughs> is that actively anti-racist practice should be in everyone's working. It shouldn't just be passive. It shouldn't just be that, oh, yeah, we don't tolerate racism here. Great, you don't tolerate it, but what are you doing to actively fight it? What in your comms and engagement are you doing? What in your policies and procedures are you doing so that your workforce know that not only is it not tolerated, but it's actively fought against? Um, I think one thing that could be really good if they special things like active bystander training, which I know that CEPA Scotland recently did do some work on, but how many directors or managers actually attended that? How many, how many of our training that we do to sort of have this anti-racist practice is actually attended by the people that are in a position to make it culture change in their organization? Um, and the last couple of points to me is things that I actually want to see put into practice really soon is that um, if we want this to actually be actionable, if we want people to take action on EDI, great, make it an RO requirement, make it an accreditation requirement that not just they've got a policy, but they can evidence the fact that 
their demographics are changing, they're reaching out to different audiences, they take action on harassment and bullying that is concrete and that is actually effective. Um, and not just a vague policy, but real, actual, concrete action. Um, and we know that it's a real issue, a sort of a training gap or an understanding gap at that higher director and manager level that um, these are areas of practice, the area of work that they're evolving all the time. And maybe that, that's fact that, great, we've identified that skills gap, so make sure the management are doing that training to make sure it's not just the people already in this involvement in the sector, in EDI, who are always attending the same training, always coming to the same networks. It's the same sort of half dozen people who do everything, burnt out to a crisp. <laughs> um, okay, like make sure that directors are doing it too. Make sure everyone's coming and make sure everyone is engaged. Um, I really like to see that as a minimum requirement for MC for NARO accreditation requirements. Um, and finally, as people have mentioned, there's so many fractions in archaeology, so many organisations, groups, different types of people that claim to represent or speak for archaeology in different ways and different um, parts of the profession. But why slavishly agree to let them speak for you? Why let them um, be that, you know, reject those organisations? If you see them, you don't quite agree with what they're doing or they don't represent you, they don't represent your colleagues or your colleagues who have left the profession because they didn't represent you, reject them, speak out against them. I think it's about time that we start to trim a bit of the dead weight and make sure that we actually have a representative profession instead.